Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Roseborough. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. All right, I have been receiving a lot of email regarding the uh, Furtick Almighty gaffe thingy. <laughs> uh, we'll we're going to walk through this. And um, let's just say that there's a whole second level as I've been working through that Furtick sermon that uh, I've for, for legitimately spent the better part of four weeks uh, working through a second layer to all of this that I've only recently been introduced to. Let's just say I've been on a crash course for the uninitiated when it comes to conspiracy theories and stuff. So you'll notice that today's episode of Fighting for the Faith, the, the title that we've selected for it is The 33 Degrees of Vertical Mighty. Yeah, there's a, there's a second layer to this episode, and uh, as a result of that, um, there, the, the first part of this episode is going to be dedicated to how not to uh, evaluate Elevation and Stephen Furtick. Uh, there's a reason I'm saying that, and you need to understand at the front end of this that I'm talking on two levels when we're doing that portion of this episode of Fighting for the Faith. Um, and then we're going to get into an actual biblical evaluation because I consider the other part of this uh, a necessary distraction that we have to take a look at. So you're thinking, what are we talking about, Roseboro? What we're talking about is we're going to have a long episode, and there's two segments to this episode, and the first segment has two levels of communication. Best way I can put it, and I don't even know how to communicate <laughs> the second level very well, because like I said, I'm uninitiated when it comes to these things. So all of that being said, as we consider what it is that Stephen Furtick said, did he really say that he's God Almighty? Is that what he really meant? We will be dealing with that in the second half, the second part of this episode, and we'll try to put the best construction on it, but we're going to show why it is that even though he preached that sermon on May 2nd, that he still hasn't yet apologized or clarified or anything like that because... Well, there's there's a reason. So all of that being said, let's let's deal with the distraction first, shall we? And that's what it is. This is the kind of stuff that ends up being a great distraction. So I put together a keynote presentation, and I've titled the presentation uh, "How Not to Evaluate Elevation and Furtick Almighty." TM. Yeah, I, I, I'm one of these guys that I, I refuse to um, to take Furtick Almighty seriously. I think the guy's ego is so big, but you get the idea. Now, I'm doing this on purpose because uh, I'm trying to communicate something, and this is being communicated on two levels. Remember when the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 says, do bear with me with a little foolishness, I'm talking like a madman? I understand that at the moment that uh, for some of you, I'm going to be sounding like a complete lunatic and uh, weird, gone out to lunch conspiracy theorist. I'm going to end up sounding like this guy. I get it. And the reason why I'm going to sound like that guy is because because this stuff sounds like that guy. But all that being said, we're going to be taking a look at how not to eva evaluate Elevation and Furtick Almighty. We're going to start with something strange, shall we? Uh, the Elevation Church logo. Never seen anything quite like it. That is a weird logo. Interesting color of orange, but Elevation Church? Elevation what, what are we elevating ourselves to? I don't know. This just seems like a weird thing. And I've never seen symbology of this type in a, you know, in a church setting. Now, remember, this is how not to evaluate uh, elevation and Furtick Almighty. Well, then, then you got elevation worship. That's the W over there. And, you know, I've seen that symbol before. It's only half of it here. But uh, yeah, let me explain here. Uh, the, that is the, uh, the, the Masonic uh, compass and ruler. And, um, you know, when, when you um, look at Elevation's logo and Elevation Worship's logo, 
you know, you you just have to scratch your head and go, hmm, that's pretty weird. And, and then again, of course, if you know your Freemasonry, and I really don't because I'm not initiated in it, and I really don't know much about it at all, this is Albert Pike's Masonic collar. And apparently he was a big mucky muck, you know, morals and dogmas and things like that. Um, and so, you know, this is just, you know, you know, that's kind of just all really weird. Now, remember, this is how not to evaluate um, elevation and Furtick Almighty. And then you have these weird things that I've noted over the years as it relates to Stephen Furtick. And uh, and that is, is that uh, in the past, he's been a guy who's had some notable rings. I mean... That kind of looks like a Masonic ring to me. And then you got, you know, well, that one right there. Let me zoom in a little bit here. And, uh, you know, I, I, I had a relative who was uh, in, in, uh, in that particular secret society. And, uh, you know, he had a ring just like it. And, in fact, it has a name. It has a name. It's um, the Masonic Carnelian Ring, or Men's Statement Ring. I mean, the two look kind of, uh, well, alike. Now, remember... This is how not to evaluate elevation and Furtick Almighty trademark. Now, th then again, you got this ring here. Uh, remember elephant, uh, elephant room? Uh, yeah, that that particular ring. Is that a Templar cross in that thing? Well, here's another look at it. Let's let's zoom out. Yeah, that kind of looks like. You know, a, a Templar cross, and then of course you got the elevation logo. But you know, here here's a cleaner version of it. Yeah, that is absolutely a Templar cross, and you know that that you know that V thingy that you know that kind of looks like that. You know, that's kind of a weird thing because that V thingy that's upside down. You know, you know here's the here again. You can kind of see the Templar cross and the V thingy. I mean, that's a Templar uh, symbol right there. You know, it's, notice the V here. Are you familiar with the Talpiot tomb? I mean, I mean after I mean, have you ever heard, heard of the hooked X and you know how when you break the X apart, you know one half of it is the female symbol symbol and the other is the male symbol. I mean, you know, I just think it's weird. I mean, everybody knows that a Christian pastor would, you know, never be a, you know, a Templar. <clears throat> anyway, um, so, you know, again, this is how not to evaluate elevation and furtic almighty. And, then, you know, and then you got strange things, tra strange things that just make you kind of go, what was that? You know, you know, stuff like this. Um, then again, I'm not initiated. I've been told that this is something important. And then I think about, well, you know, the, the, everybody knows that secret societies, they have handshakes and stuff. And, you know, Furtick would never talk about People, that, right? She said, you had a secret handshake with everybody on that campus. <laughs> right. You know, um, you know, uh, that in a secret handshake. I, you know, I, I don't know what to make of it. And you guys remember that Hey Haters video? You know, uh, we put a Max Holiday dub on it. And, of course, you know, everyone laughs at that when they, they see Stephen Furtick's face. And he goes, Hey Haters, you, you look like a toddler, right? Well, yeah, you know, well, here's the original without our dub. And, uh, you know, when you go back and you watch this thing and listen to what he's saying, one has to ask the question, what exactly is his agenda? Uh, he here's his conclusion uh, to Hey Haters, listen. Waste your time casting stones, breaking bones, belittling everyone you consider opposed? Are you gonna exchange your hate, trade the pain of the same, embrace a new way to change the world? Embrace a new way to change the world. What? As he continues. Honor's yeah. time has come and a new light has dawned to fill the tongue of the Senate and pierce the heart of the skeptic. This generation is waiting to restore the hope of a nation. This generation it is waiting for to what? To restore the hope of a nation? Now, I'm a pastor, I'm ordained, and um, I've never seen in Scripture that command that I'm supposed to, you know, 
restore the hope of a nation? I mean, that kind of sounds like it has rings of Novos Ordo Seclorum or something, you know, like that. But then again, you know, I'm not initiated. And, um, well, like I said, this, this whole exercise, this is how not to evaluate elevation and Furtick Almighty. In fact, I would note that this is the kind of stuff that can be very distracting. And right now there's a fellow who uh, recently put out a video talking about this, uh, this secret society within a secret society, and the secret society that's embedded in the secret society is full of really powerful uh, Luciferians who like to throw the 666 up, and that they've got a plan, and it's, and it's counting down. It's their, their plan is counting down and eventually will result in this being implemented. Hmm. And here's the thing. It, the reason why this is how not to evaluate elevation in Furtick Almighty, even if all of that is true, is because you end up looking like this. And so the issue is this, is that when it comes to secret societies and the symbols that they place out in plain sight for everybody to see, but it, only if you are exposed to somebody who can interpret them for you, are you able to even know that they're even there? The issue is, is that with little you know always leads to major conspiracy theories. And I would note this, and that is, is that the scriptures 2,000 years ago made it very clear that whatever the, the goal is of any secret society, whatever their plan is, God's word has already laid that out bare 2,000 years ago. So what they're doing in secret, scripture talks about openly. And so let's not get well caught up in the great distraction Instead, let's focus on the Great Commission. And it's absolutely clear in Scripture that we can evaluate men like Stephen Furtick without having to rely on, well, deciphering the codes and the symbols that they're throwing. Because the thing we're supposed to be listening to is their message and comparing what they're saying to God's word and testing to see if it's really from God. Yeah, kind of think of it this way, is that uh, this guy is talking about a Luciferian plot, you know, with all the 666 people and we're on the countdown to when this is going to happen, right? But he here's the thing, is that scripture is really clear that already at the time of the apostles, so Paul, that there were people in the church who were agents of the devil. How do you spot them? Not by the symbols they throw. Although if they're throwing symbols to, you know, to communicate to other people who and what they are, well, that's just foolishness. They should be a little bit more secretive. But the thing is, is that even if they're not throwing symbols and they're not part of a secret society, then you can know this for a fact. Here's what Paul says, talking about the so-called super apostles, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So what I'm doing, I will continue to do, Paul writes, in order to undermine the claim of those who like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms that we do. Such men, these so-called super apostles, they are false apostles. They are deceitful workmen. They are disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. That's exactly right. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And any group that would tell you that Lucifer is the light bearer is in league with Lucifer. So all of that being said, we can compare then what people are saying to, you know, it, to what God's word says. And note this then, because there are agents of the devil, of the Antichrist himself that have been in the church sent by the devil for the last 2,000 years, we can always spot them, even if they don't signal what they are. And the way we can spot them is based on their message. They preach a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. So when it comes to evil, be babes. 
when it comes to good, excel and mature in that. This is what scripture teaches us. So all of that being said, let's do just a little bit of a mini study on Luciferian doctrine, shall we? So Luciferian doctrine kind of works. This is kind of primer number 101. Uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self. And he's talking about in the church. He's talking about, because you know, you'll know the world already you know, is in love with itself. Uh, we're all born dead in trespasses and sins. He's describing something that takes place in the church in the days immediately before Jesus' return as a result of the great falling away because of the great apostasy. So that being the case, there people will be lovers of self. Who was the exemplar when it comes to being a lover of self? Ooh, ooh, pick me, I know. Uh, it's Satan. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, describing the devil, says this. Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. I will make myself like the Most High. I will sit on the mountain of assembly. I, 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 right? Satan is the exemplar of the narcissist, and that's what a lover of self is. So when you are hearing somebody who is a pastor teaching you narcissism and exemplifying it in his own life. In fact, for more than a decade, we've been warning the body of Christ about Stephen Furtick. In fact, on the podcast, we even took that old song, You're So Vain, and we we modified the lyrics and came up with our own parody version of that song. Uh, and the lyrics were, you're so vain, you probably think the Bible's about you. Don't you? You know, yeah, you, you get the, uh, you're so vain, you probably think the Bible's about you. You're so vain, right? And this was all to describe whom? Stephen Furtick. He is the king of the Narsajites. He is the exemplar, if you would, of satanic Luciferian preaching. He is the perfect example of what it means to be the lover of self and to read himself into every single biblical text. I mean, by the way he preaches the Bible, you'd think that Furtick is the one who parted the Red Sea. You would think that Furtick was the one who built the ark. You'd think that Furtick was the one who reached out his hand and rescued Peter. When Peter failed when he was walking on the water, you'd think it was Furtick who rose from the dead on the third day. You'd think, yeah, you, you get the idea, right? So all of that being said, the, Satan is all about teaching you to love yourself satanically. That's what he's all about. That's what he's all about. And you can always hear his theology because when it comes down to it, there's only two religions in the whole world, only two. And the two religions are the religion of self-glory. And that's what Furtick ex exemplifies, the religion of self-glory. And then there's the religion that says this, to humble yourself, to confess that you are a sinner and that you are unclean, that you have sinned against God and humbly ask for him to pardon you, to forgive you. And that religion teaches that because Christ went to the cross and bled and died for our sins, that we are forgiven and pardoned. And we are then called to humbly, after denying ourselves, take up our crosses, the implements of our death, to follow Christ to his death, to our death, by suffering persecution and difficulty and hardship. That's what we're called to, not to glorify ourselves, have our best life now or anything like that. No, the religion of Jesus is the religion founded by the one who, although he was by nature God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself, taking on the form of a slave and was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalts him. 
So humble yourself. And you're going to note, if you go into the archives of our podcast, Fighting for the Faith, we have covered Furtick ad nauseum for more than a decade. And I have yet to see him rightly handle a biblical text and properly preach Christ and him crucified for our sins and to rightly handle a biblical text and point us to Jesus. He always points us to ourselves. So you don't even have to know what any of the symbols are. You don't have to decode any conspiracy theory or anything like this if you just know your Bible and you listen. Listen to what these men are preaching and Furtick isn't alone you would recognize them for what they are and who it is that really sent them because it wasn't Christ. So all of that being said, that's the first half, first portion of our episode today. And like I said, and the, 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 that first part, it's kind of uh, written on two levels. And if you understand the second level, great. And if you don't, Great. <laughs> That's the way I can put it. I actually envy the people who do not understand the second level of what we just did. All of that being said, we're going to take a look at what it is that Furtick preached. Was, this was May 2nd of this year, 2021. And the name of the message is, It's Always Been In You. Now, people have been asking me, Chris, do you think that Furtick really meant that he is deity? Answer, if I'm being charitable and putting the best construction on it, I think I know what he did and maybe not. But here's the thing. It's on Furtick to apologize and to clarify. Today, when we're recording this, it's July 9th. So we've gone two full months and a few days since he this was preached. And there, well, May, yeah, May and June. And, uh, and well, no, no explanation, no clarification, no apology from Furtick at all. And there's a reason why he hasn't apologized. And it has to do with what happens in the first couple of minutes of the sermon. Now, a little bit of a note. We will be distorting Mr. Furtick, and we will also be changing the, uh, the pitch of his voice, and there's a reason for it, because being the king of the Narsajites and uh, being Luciferian in his uh, endeavors, uh, Mr. Furtick doesn't seem to believe that the laws of, of the land apply to him, and he always has this bad habit of trying to take down videos that criticize him, and so we're just going to make it a little bit more difficult for him, and uh, we're going to transmogrify things, and I will state this up front. We are using these video segments specifically for the purpose of criticism. We're going to be criticizing and evaluating his false teaching and Bible twisting and explain to you what's really wrong in the sermon. And when you see what's wrong in the sermon, you're going to recognize that the, the statement that he made, I am God Almighty, good grief, who, who, who can possibly say that as a Christian pastor and, you know, and say it in, in a way that you know, was, <laughs> well, as uh, ambiguous as to what it meant what, the way he did. Um, but uh, that that's, how should we put it, just, just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what's wrong with this sermon. So let's take a look. We're going to break this up into several segments. We're not going to review the whole thing. Uh, I believe Kozar and uh, Paulette have done that. But uh, we're, we're going to pick up a few highlights along the way and uh, keep your Bibles handy or you're going to need them. All right, so we're going to start with him at, at introducing the sermon and the biblical texts plural, because he's going to do a weird cut uh, here, and uh, we'll talk about w w what this what this means for the later in the sermon. Welcome to all of our locations, and we trust that God's presence will be powerful wherever you are, and I really mean that. Sappy music. He always has got that going, not at the end, but like almost throughout his whole sermon. And that's kind of what my sermon's about today as well. So listen to this in Genesis chapter 34, verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me. Now note here, he begins partway through a story. We don't know what preceded this. And so Genesis 34 verse 30 is a weird, nonsensical, that, that makes no sense at all, place to start a sermon. And this is one of the things that he does. He does not meaningfully preach through texts and their narratives. By making me obnoxious to the Canaanites and Perizzites, the people living in this land, we are few in number. 
And if they join forces against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. Now go to Gen it, Okay, no sooner does he finish that, now he's gonna jump ahead half a chapter into chapter 35. Watch the cut. This 35, verse 11. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. The NIV 84 says, kings will come from your body. <clears throat> now, by the way, the, the people going, th those are the volunteers that sit in what's called the bullpen. Their job is to fawn over every phrase that sounds pseudo, pseudo profound that, that comes from his lips. Ooh, yay, the kings are going to come from, and, and notice the way they're reacting. God didn't promise that kings are coming from your body. Believe me, no kings are coming from mine. All right, he's not saying that this somehow applies to you in that way. What? So there's something weird going on here. Now, we're going to note that it's the cut where he goes from chapter 34, breaks, and then jumps into you know 11 verses ahead into verse 35, where God says, I am God Almighty, and he's saying that to Jacob that this then explains most likely what it is that he was attempting to mimic, if you would, or he, he tried to set it up here, he executed really poorly. Uh, it, this is what he was trying to do. When, so when he got to the big punchline where he's whooping everybody up into a frenzy and Furtick just breaks out of nowhere and says, I am God Almighty, what he was, I think, trying to do was make a connection back to Genesis 35, 11. Except for, let's just say he didn't stick the landing at all. The, the transition was so abrupt. It really sounds like he's claiming to be God Almighty. But the, no, already we got a problem. And that is, is that the text, the way he's handled them at the very beginning, he's already twisted them. And he's already set this up for his favorite Bible twisting technique, which is called narcissism. The reading of yourself, the reading of the self-love of you into a biblical text. Rather than exegeting out what the passage means, he's reading himself into these texts. And I'll show you where he does it. But here then what follows is going to be the reason why Furtick has not issued an apology yet and probably will not. I, I'll say probably because you never know. He might just have a moment where he gets a conscience and realizes, you know, it was probably foolish of me to ambiguously say the phrase, I am God Almighty. Uh, and so it, it, it's incumbent upon me to you know, to allay the scandal here by clarifying what I said. So I, I give him this much of a chance that he'll do that. Um, as far as the, the, the chance that he won't do it, you know, it's, it's you know, bigger than my office is the best way I could put it. So, but here's the reason why. Watch. So I want to preach for a moment and God told me to tell you this. See, that's the reason why. See, because no sooner does he twist these biblical texts by taking them, ripping them out of context, smooshing them together the way he did, but he now claims that what he's going to preach, he is preaching because God specifically told him to preach this message. And when we're done with this episode of Fighting for the Faith, we will be able to definitively say, God didn't tell him that at all, unless the deity that he worships and serves is Lucifer. Yeah, so let me back this up and yeah, you'll see what I'm saying. So I want to preach for a moment and God told me to tell you this. It's always been in you. What's always been in me? Sin? You know, I was born dead in trespasses and sins, you know, by nature an object of God's wrath. Yeah, that's the doctrine of original sin. Is that what you're talking about? It's always been in you. 
But what's it? God, what you showed me was so amazing. What you show. So here's the thing. He's now going to pray that what God showed him, that he's going to have the power to execute in this sermon. So he can't apologize because if he apologizes, then he destroys the whole pretense that he set up here, that this is a divinely inspired message and interpretation that God gave him directly. And I ask for your help now that I could share it with them these people that you love, this church that you're building. I pray, Lord, not that I might just preach good, but that they would hear good. Mm -hmm. All right, so there, that's your setup. Now, what we're going to do here is I'm going to go to the next segment. Now, I'm going to note that if you look at Furtick's sermons, he's actually pretty diligent about using that f wonderful feature on YouTube where you can take a video and chop it up into chapters or topics. And so, you know, after he sets things up and reads the biblical text or twist them really at the beginning, he then launches into a story which helps support the primary message that he's trying to deliver. And it's a story as it relates to uh, his son or one of his sons. And now let me go over here and you can kind of see this, that what he does is he he's talking about his son's YouTube channel and how his son you know, when he was a wee lad, you know, was a drummer, and now he has a YouTube channel that teaches people how to do trap beats. I have no idea what a trap beat is, but um, so, you know, and so his point is that his son, you know, what he's doing now is due to the fact that he, you know, he was already, you know, it was all, it was already in him, even when he was you know, four years old or five years old. And so that sets the foundation then for his twisting of these biblical texts. Because again, the, the name of the message is it's always been in you. And Furtick claims that this comes directly from God. It's here that we're going to go to the next section and listen to Furtick continue to lay the foundation. There's a little bit more foundation for this particular message. Jacob grow up. The, the Bible character, Jacob, you get to see, this is a rare thing, the sonogram of the patriarch through which the whole nation of Israel came. And I think that's a real gift that we get to see that Jacob was even wrestling in his mother's womb. And then we get to see him at age 77 running from his brother Esau, who he had been in competition with his whole life. We get to see him reconcile with Esau at age 97 after 20 years of hiding with his uncle Laban, having a family. It's, it's a lot that we get to see. And he has finally made it to Canaan. Let's clap for Jacob that after all he went through, he finally made it to Canaan. <laughs> now there's a reason why he's, wait, let's uh, Way to go, Jacob! You finally made it to... Because here's what he's doing. He's going to explicitly teach you to then take this model of what you've seen happening in Jacob's life and see the... to so kind of read yourself into the text. That, In fact, that's kind of the point of what comes up next is uh, the, the section called A Promised Land Problem. And if you know the story, no sooner does Jacob get to Canaan and, and Shechem that his uh, daughter Dinah is violated. And, uh, and this ends up, well, what ends up happening is, is that two of, of Jacob's sons avenge their sister by killing all the men of Shechem. So but watch what Furtick does with this. This is very fascinating. Get here. And the Bible says he makes it safely to Canaan, mm -hmm. the place of the promise, only to be struck by what I call a promised land problem. <laughs> so there's third world problems, first world problems, and promised land problems. So he was struck by a promised land problem. Okay. The reason I call it that is because when he arrives in Canaan, where God has him, something so terrible happens within his own family. And this is where I want to break away from the narrative and preach to somebody. 
Now watch what he does here. This is where he nar- he now t- narcissists the text, reads himself and reads you and I into it. Because often you get to a place, a place that you imagined in your mind. Maybe it's an age, a stage of life, a certain type of success, a certain accomplishment, a certain achievement, something that you got to that you worked really hard for. And no sooner can you pay for it with a hundred pieces of silver and put your tent up, than disaster strikes your very own family and threatens to destroy what means the most to you. Now when Jacob's sons heard about it, particularly his sons, Reuben and Levi, or Simeon and Levi, they both decided to take matters into their own hands because their sister had been defiled. Right, so you see what he just did there? That's the Bible twisting technique that we call Jesus. He's read us all into the biblical text in a way that is not exegesis. This is just flat out eisegesis, but narcissistically so. And so when you see somebody engaging in this, he's not rightly handling God's word at all. This is the sh- one of the clear signs that you're dealing with one of the preachers that scripture warned us about, the ones who are the lovers of themselves. He's not pointing us to Christ. He's pointing to some weird thing. So do you, do you know what, what's you know, what's always been in you yet? I have no idea what's always been in me aside from sin. So with that, we're kind of, kind of head to the next portion. And this is where Furtick is going to talk about the name of this section is the concept of covenant. And this is a dead giveaway that this guy is twisting scripture. Now, if I were to ask you right off the top of your head, and maybe some of you remember because we've covered this extensively on Fighting for the Faith in the previous months. So it's been less than a year and we've taught in depth on the covenants as it relates to you know, the difference between the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the new covenant. So if you remember, and this is a little bit of review, Noahic covenant, the big promise is that God will not destroy the entire earth via a flood again. And the sign of that covenant, rainbow. Uh, The Abrahamic covenant is the promise that God would bless the whole world through the seed of Abraham. That's Jesus. And the uh, sign of that covenant is circumcision. The Mosaic covenant is a land lease covenant between God and the people of Israel. The sign of that covenant is the Sabbath. And the, and the new covenant, what is the promise of the new covenant? Well, if you want to start looking ahead now, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah 31. And we're going to let Furtick talk first here, because if you can't even properly explain what is the new covenant and what the promise of the new covenant is, and you're going to twist that promise into something that it isn't, then you are a very dangerous teacher and you have no business preaching in Christ's church. You, you know, covenants are like Christianity 101 stuff. And if you don't understand what the new covenant is and what the promise of the new covenant is, you don't know what the gospel is about. So with that, let's let Furtick explain to us this concept of covenant. And we'll take a look at, at Jeremiah 31 along the way you about a concept. This is not a pop culture concept. It's the concept of covenant. Everybody say covenant. Jacob isn't just going off of a good feeling. Jacob isn't just going off of a track record. Jacob isn't going off of a fortune cookie. Jacob isn't going off of, off of an emotional high. Jacob isn't going off of something that he got from a, you know, Jacob's not going off of something that he read on one Bible verse of the day. He has a covenant. Say covenant. Now, in in the Bible, a covenant can be, first of all, it can be with another person. It can can be, in the Bible, the context of marriage was not convenience, it was covenant. True. In the Bible, the, the context of my relationship with God was not my behavior, it was my covenant with him. You have a personal covenant? I mean, I, I'm in the new covenant. Uh, what about you? Covenant. Covenant. Jacob. Jake. So good. So good. All those people in the bullpen, they are the voluntary manipulators. I mean, let me ask you this. I mean, when you go to a church, even when the pastor's like bringing it, okay, 
is the natural inclination for people to just whoop on and holler and carry on like this? No. You know, this, this, this is all purposely designed to manipulate the audience there at Elevation. Is moving, not, not in certainty, he's moving in covenant with God. You know, that, that the relationship that I have with God is not based on the same covenant that Jacob had. Jacob had a covenant with God that God will be with me. And that's awesome. How many thank God that he's with you? That's awesome. But look what, what happens. On our end of the bargain, we can't keep that up. Oh, so you followed God perfectly through every season of your life. Of course in the valley you faint. Of course in the hard times you get led astray. Of course your heart is drawn to other gods to worship things that you can see instead of the God that you can't see or figure out. That's called idolatry. Are you going to tell them to repent and be forgiven for that sin? So God said in, in Jeremiah uh, 31, this is what he said in Jeremiah 31. He said, I'm going to give you a different covenant. These days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. Now, here what we're going to do, we're going to, I'm going to show you what this text says when you get to the punchline. Because Furtick here twist the scriptures via omission. And the part that he omits is the most important part of this passage. And the reason he's omitting it is so that he can create a different promise of the new covenant. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's absolutely diabolical how he does it. So let's do this. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31. And you'll note he's starting at verse 31. And this is the prophecy that was given by God to the prophet Jeremiah as it relates to the new covenant. And here's what it says. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. Not like their co covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, but my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares Yahweh. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. They, I will be their God. They shall be my people. And um, no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each one bro and his brother saying, know Yahweh, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest declares Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So you're going to note there's an eschatological promise. This is a, the the promise that you know, in the world to come, in, you know, after Christ restores all things, behold, He's making all things new, new heavens, new earth. That in that world, no no longer will there be need for you to be taught anything about God. Everybody will know God, and uh, and so pastors like myself, we're out of a job. Okay, you won't need YouTube videos like this. <laughs> <laughs> Best way to put it. But the other bit is the promise that what? I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. A good way to put it is this way. In the new covenant, the covenant that we are in as Christians with God, God remembers to forget our sins. God remembers to forget our sin. I will remember their sin no more. <sighs> This is good stuff, right? That's the whole promise of the new covenant, that God forgives our iniquities, pardons us. He remembers our sin no more. If you remembered your sin, well, yeah, well, then you don't have eternal life in, in the new earth to look forward to. You have the second death and the, the lake of fire to look forward to. So it is a good thing that God remembers to forget our sins. I will remember their sin no more. Now, watch what Furtick does, because this is so slick. He is going to omit the real promises of the new covenant and insert a promise that isn't here. He's going to create his own covenant a new covenant, a new, new covenant. It's the, it's the Furtick audaciously revised translational covenant. So that being said, let's watch what he does here. I will not be, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, says Jacob, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. 
This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel at that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. That's the inside for what the law was powerless to do. That's the inside. So this, so God's going to, well, it's always been in you. It's on your inside. In that it was weakened by the sinful nature. God did by sending his son, Jesus, in the likeness of sinful men. I don't have the Jacob covenant. I have the Jesus covenant. I have a covenant that whatever you put on me, God put something in me that is greater than what you put on me. Well, that's awkward. Um, that's not the promise of the new covenant. The Jesus covenant? That whatever you put on me, God's put something in me that's greater than what you put on me? No, that, that, that is absurd. Absolute diabolical twisting. And here's the issue. Because we're actually dealing with something directly connected to the biblical gospel, Christ died for our sins and was raised again uh, on the third day in accordance with the scripture for our justification. This, this Jesus covenant that he's talking about here, this is a different gospel. Mm-hmm. And no, it's all about what? Self-glory. So I know you got a lot on you, but I came to preach. There's something in you that has always been greater. There's something in you that's always been greater. Yeah. Yay. And, you know, I feel like with the guy in the Hammond, you know, B3 in the background, you know, if he goes, da 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 I'll say charge and hope for the Dodgers to hit a home run or something, you know? Are you getting this revelation? Uh, notice what he called that? Yeah, this is what God told him to preach. So God told you to, to actually change the promise of the new covenant prophesied in Jeremiah 31 to the Jesus covenant that whatever somebody puts on you, God has put something in you that's greater than what people put on you? Hmm. Yeah, so it's from there then that he really takes it to the next level. And this is the context then of him saying the statement, I am Furtick Almighty. Um, let's listen in. It's been in you. You were beating on that high. It sounded like a trash can, but it was in you. The rhythm was in you. It's in you. It's in you. It's in you. And what you got to be so careful about is not to let people put anything on you. And I'm not just talking about failure, I'm talking about success. Jacob's biggest issue is that he always identified himself by something external. This has nothing to do with sound exegesis regarding Genesis 34 and 35. I mean, it's... That has nothing to do with these texts. So when it came time to make peace with Esau, he sent gifts ahead of him because he thought maybe my gift will bring me peace. And some of us are like that. We always think we have to make a good impression. We're always living in an avatar. We're always living in some version of ourselves that seems presentable. Or we're always identified, I talked to you about this last week, about what we can do. And so in doing what we can do, other people will identify you by what you can do. And then they will limit you by what you can do. And then you will begin to think that you are what you do. And then you will- This has nothing whatsoever to do with Genesis 34 and five. Uh, this is bizarre. It's yourself and gain the world, and Jesus said, what good is it? Don't let anybody put anything on you that will cause you to forget what God put in you. That goes... What exactly did God put in me? And note the vagaries here. What is it that God put in me? Because you quoted Jeremiah 31 and you didn't talk about God actually putting his law in our hearts. Your struggles? See, I think Jacob, I think Jacob, his name, his name means supplanter, but his new name, Israel, is almost just as bad. It means struggles with God. Now watch what he does with this. It's so subtle, but it is diabolical. Luciferian, if you would. Listen again. But his new name, Israel, is almost just as bad. It means struggles with God. 
So he's trying to get him to see, you've never been fighting with Laban. You've never been fighting with Esau. The fight that you have to win for your life has not been with them. It's always been in you. Um, so Israel, he who struggles with God, who is Furtick saying he's struggling with? Himself? He's struggling with something within him? Does that make Jacob God or divine? See what I'm saying here? This is, this is really weird. Okay. Jacob struggled with God, literally and spiritually, both. And God changed his name to Israel, the one who struggles, wrestles with God. Um, God is outside of us. It's true that the Holy Spirit is inside of us, but, I, but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit doesn't make me God. Yeah, so the, the weird stuff going on here. I'm backing it up just a little. Listen again. The fight that you have to win for your life has not been with them. It's always been in you. Shouting it doesn't make it true. Because if you believe it's in you, there's nothing anybody can put on you that can cancel what I put in you. Before you were born, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. It's always been in you. What has always been in you? It's always been in you. What's the it? That teaching gift has always been in you. You just had to get past what you would put on yourself. The idea that I'm not a preacher, I'm just a little girl. Um, um, Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Father do not call women to be pastors. Wow, this is bad. I don't have anything to say. That was always in you. It was in you when you were sitting at Life Action Revival, listening to Steve Canfield six nights a week, and God was filling you with his word. It just took the right rain to bring the seed out of the soil for what God put in you. The right rain to the seed and soil thingy. What, what, what's the it there again? We were just a little girl. And here it comes. This, so this is the context immediately before uh, the Furtick Almighty state. Always been in you. And there's nobody that can leave my life that can keep God from keeping his covenant with me. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. And there it is. So we've got a false covenant, the thing he calls the Jesus covenant, and uh, which totally overlooks the whole thing about God remembering our sins no more, and totally twists. Uh, you know, he takes you know a, a preaching gift in a little girl as an example of what God puts in you, as promised by Jeremiah thirty-one. But yet it says God will put His law in our hearts. Um, so we've got some big problems here. And then in the midst of all of this, he says, "I am God Almighty." What a terrible deity he is. I'm just saying, I mean, if, if he were really divine, I mean, the universe is sunk. <laughs> Might as well fi figure out a way to jump off. Um, so let me come back here and let me show you what it is that I think he was doing. Because I mentioned it at the beginning. And that is, is that he makes the cut between Genesis 34, 30 and Genesis 35, 11. Here it is again. Now go to Genesis 35, verse 11. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. You see, I think that's what he was trying to do there. And that's the best way I can put it. But see, the thing is, is that, you know, the transition was... Uh, <clears throat> so best case scenario, it's a gaffe. And boy, is it a bad one. And it requires him to apologize, but he can't because he claims that this is an inspired message. God specifically told him to preach this message. And if he apologized, 
well, the whole pretense of him hearing directly from God and his messages being inspired interpretations of scripture, well, that would all start to unravel. So listen again to this. It's terrible. Um, A life that can keep God from keeping his covenant with me. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. No, really, you're not. Get that off you. That's not your name. That's not your station. That's not your end. It's in me. It's in me. It's in me. It is God that worketh in you. Uh, yeah, this is just pure emotionalism mixed with some really bad narcissism and uh, a twisting of God's word isogetically. Wow. It's always been in you. And there's nobody that can leave my life that can keep God from keeping his covenant with me. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Get that off you. That's not your name. That's not your station. That's not your end. It's been me. It's been me. It's been me. It's done. That work is in you. You get the point. So um, this is the theology of self-glory. And uh, coming back to our little mini lesson on uh, the devil, all right? Um, the, the, the devil is all about, well, who is he about himself? He's all about himself. Remember when Jesus was being tempted by the devil? Uh, it says in Matthew 4, Jesus... Um, you know, after the devil tempts and, you know, throw himself off the temple, Jesus says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, quotes Deuteronomy. So again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. What a sick puppy. So Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. It's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Uh-huh. So, uh, what is the devil all about? Self-worship. It's all about you. It's in you, man. What, and, and, and this new covenant, the, the, the Jesus covenant, you know, where whatever anyone puts on you, because what God put in you, it's greater than what anything put, God, anyone puts on you. I couldn't think of a more narcissistic twisting, evacuating the real promises of the new covenant than what I just heard. So, uh, is, uh, is Furtick a Luciferian? Oh, you betcha. Is he, uh, is he uh, somebody who's an agent of the devil disguised as a shepherd of Christ? Of course. And you don't need to know any secret society symbols to know that. You just need to learn how to rightly handle God's word and listen carefully. Listen carefully to his messages because he's not pointing you to Christ. He's pointing you to yourself and himself. So hopefully you found this helpful. If so, all the information on how you can share the video is down below in the description. And until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen.